told you this guy's a genius. Self-proclaimed, maybe. Well, as long as it works for him. Exactly my point. Awesome. Escape the was confrontationalism and that what you recommended instead was subversion and boring from within. Can you tell us what you mean by subversion and boring from within? Yeah, mainly what I mean is moving with step. But here's the thing that I think was so problematic about the 1960s. Um, a single ambitious graduate student in biochemistry could produce five million hits of LSD in the local junior college laboratory if he had the keys and a long weekend. Five million hits. This means that you are not trying to get your friends and yourself high. This means that you are trying to become the CEO of an international criminal enterprise capable of making millions and millions of dollars. And when you make, when you manufacture five million hits of a psychedelic drug, this is like whipping out a loaded gun and gesturing at the government with it. They're not amused. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, let's think of a, of a psilocybin mushroom grower. If you're a psilocybin mushroom grower and you do nothing but grow and you work like a dog for six months, you might be able to produce 10,000 hits of psilocybin. 10,000 hits, as opposed to 5 million hits. This is a micro-industry. It doesn't create vast criminal pyramids. If you have 10,000 hits of psilocybin that you have to get rid of over six months, you have a few connections and you sell it. If you have 5 million hits of something, you have to uh, sell it at a very low price to a second level of middlemen who slightly raise the price to sell it to a third level of middlemen and finally it gets down to the street. In other words, you have to organize a criminal conspiracy of some sort. This alarms the government. The other thing is the government is very alarmed when people make money off drugs. Well, if you're a dedicated mushroom grower, you can support yourself and your family in a moderately middle-class style, but you're not going to be buying a Lexus. You won't be making a payment on an apartment in Saint-Tropez out of this. It's just a living, 
And, I, and when you think about the fact that you know, these big ships that bring weed up off the coast of Florida, a guy with a fast speedboat, a guy who is a peon in that organization, they pay a quarter of a million dollars per trip to the mothership. And if you have a good speedboat, you can make three trips a night. You can make $750,000 a night bringing weed off these motherships. And you're not a major player. You're a disposable peon way down in the structure of this criminal organization. So the money differential is incredible. That's why I think the, the plants are so exciting uh, and why I urge people to grow mushrooms. You can be assured of the purity. You can't produce so much that you're going to wreck your life and bring guys with flak jackets kicking down your front door. And it all proceeds in a much less hysterical fashion. Uh, the LSD thing was confrontational, and the people who were pushing it had a wild gleam in their eye. I mean, they wanted to pull down Western civilization in the next 18 months. Well, Western civilization wasn't interested in being pulled down and showed that it had resources to fight that that we could barely conceive of. So I think plants and stealth, and I love the slow spread of mushrooms, the slow spread of ayahuasca analogs. Ayahuasca is even harder to produce than mushrooms. I mean, to get together 500 hits of ayahuasca is an enormous industrial undertaking. So let's move so slowly that they hardly know we're there. And also, it's not necessary to present a, 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 a phenomenon of dropping out. I mean, I think it's much better to take over. The, when you walk into these software labs in California, everybody has hair down to their ass. Everybody is a freak. It's perfectly out in front that the creativity that is the unique hallmark of the American civilization has for the past 30 years been sustained by psychedelic substances. When the Japanese want mahogany, they go to Java. When they want furniture, they go to Sweden. When they want brain power, they go to California. And it's psychedelic brain power that they export. So if we were to truly limit our access to psychedelics, we would, that would probably be the final blow to our ability to function and participate in world markets. Because without our creativity, what are we? Yeah. It just raises the question then about access to DMT. I mean, how do we get it? Well, and I mean, I guess there was the, the five million hits. I don't know if it's a different chemical process that you know is more difficult with DMT. But why didn't it? Why isn't it happening? Well, I think what happens with DMT is that chemists who can make it make small batches, and consequently, unless you're their roommate or their girlfriend it's all gone by the time you hear about it. Uh, in, in an ordinary laboratory, it's quite difficult to make more than a uh, hundred grams. That's only four ounces. Uh, to scale up, to do industrial uh, production of DMT, you basically you need a small pharmaceutical factory. You need big stainless steel bats, you need complex temperature controls, so forth and so on. Uh, I think DMT will always be a thing spotty and and in limited supply until it's legal, or if it becomes legal, and then it can just be produced. Yeah. George Farley said that he thought that uh, humans were created by Earth so that they could make plastics, that Earth itself could make plastics. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a cheerful idea. Uh, how about this? Humans were invented by plants to move seeds around. <laughs> that's a little more organic view of things. I mean, what is so good about plastic that the Earth would want to make it? Uh, it may be that <clears throat> what we do make are thinking machines. And that's a little scary. Uh, you know, Marshall McLuhan said a wonderful thing. He said, we are the genitals of our technologies. We exist 
only to improve next year's model. And that's a kind of scary thought. It took us millions of years to evolve to the point where we are. Uh, the rate at which our machines are evolving under the design process which we control is a million times more rapid. I mean, look at the computer. You know, you know Univac is 1948. That's less than 50 years ago. The computer sitting behind me is 100 times more powerful than Univac. If automobiles had, de had developed at this rate, then they would go 10,000 miles an hour on a nickel's worth of gas twice around the world. So, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that silicon is where the, the, our technology is the part of us that is evolving. Our bodies have stayed pretty much the same for 100,000 years. Meanwhile, we've shed and replaced our technologies 500 times in that period and are doing it ever faster. And you know, years ago, they used to say machines can't think. Have you noticed how that rap has fallen out of the press? You don't hear it anymore. Now nobody's sure exactly what's possible. Parallel processing, chaos theory, cellular automata, if the question is now so mathematically complex that no one's sure whether machines can think or not because no one's exactly sure what thinking is in this uh, And, you know, one scenario for our own salvation is that we will somehow be downloaded into circuitry or that we will somehow become machines and therefore no longer need to make such intense demands upon the earth. Uh, but uh, I don't exactly understand how that scenario is to be brought to completion. But people like Hans Moravik and uh, uh, Tibbet and these people, uh, th this is their vision, you know. Nanotechnology, machine replacement of subcellular organelles in human beings, a gradual replacement of human uh, cellular material until your entire thing is spun gold, silicone, and iridium. And yet there was never a moment when you ceased to be yourself. Uh, these things are coming. I mean, we, are, we have many strategies and many options, and it's a, a hell of a mess that we find ourselves in, and many, many different things will be tried. The definition of humanness is up for grabs. We are not monkeys. We are not angels. What are we? You know, is man good? This is the question that we may be on the brink of answering. Yeah. You might say society might be 10% people take uh, psychedelics. But how, how is that going to make the rest of the planet change? Just by the vibration of it? How is it going to cause the people in Nebraska, right? Well, every social revolution is made with 10% or less of the population. Revolutions are not made by majorities. I think that the way, so the way you change society is by changing its language. We can't evolve into something we can't describe. Therefore, the first thing we have to do is describe where we want to go. And I see psychedelics as such a stimulation to creativity that this is how they make the change. You know, people say that the 60s had no consequence. The whole world we're living in is defined by the issues of the 60s. The whole new age is essentially a flight from psychedelics, but an effort to nevertheless maintain the lessons and the insights of psychedelics. So, I, I think that the critical 10% of society that does the planning, the inventing, the implementing, and the designing is the sector of society that is being impacted by psychedelics and, and that can make change. The domain in which these changes should take place is the domain of art. We need to change the world into art. So much of the design process is haphazard. Like, you know, you look at this hotel. It was designed by an architect. It's a coherent whole. 
but it's embedded in the island of Maui, which is not a coherent whole. There is no plan for the island of Maui. It's just, you know, weasels buy land and put up hotels, and then the government builds sewers and provides electricity. But there is no master plan about a certain level. We need planning at every level. We need to express aesthetic intent at every level. Cities cannot be haphazard arrangements of contractors, projects, and dreams. The entire city, the entire planet, needs to be brought in to the design process. This may horrify you, it horrifies me, but I don't see at this point that we have any choice. Uh, we are globally impacting the planet. So now do we want to do that in a haphazard and unpredictable manner, or do we want to somehow take control of it and decide how the whole thing is going to look? We need big ideas, and then we need the courage to implement them. Uh, we need to rediscover nature. We need to rediscover the richness of our own souls. We need to learn how to communicate with each other. We need to learn how to love each other. We need to learn how to appreciate differences. And we need to learn how to stretch ourselves toward the transcendental. The idea that society should be war, endless competition among individuals with the devil take the hindmost, we see the consequences of that. A ruined earth, unhappy people, uh, and unhappy children. So uh, it, it's a matter of letting order, the internal order of our souls, the architectonics of our dreams, we need to let that emerge. And one of the things we have to do is we have to free ourselves from enslavement to the idea that everything has to make a buck. You know? What they're saying now is, we'll save the world if you'll show us a solution that makes a buck. Well, it may be necessary to jettison the idea of making a buck out of the enterprise of saving the planet and just save the planet for its own sake. You know, that, that's the dilemma that we're looking at. <coughs> yeah? What's the difference between uh, smoking or uh, eating muscles? Okay. Oh, smoking is not effective. There are two, the psilocybin is spread through them at only 0.05%. You really can't get enough smoking. If you had pure psilocybin, you could smoke it, and that's something worth shooting for. I've never done that. I've often wondered what that would be like. That might be, you know, the next rave. Um, smoking psilocybin would, it would come on as fast as DMT, but it would be psilocybin. That's an interesting thing to pursue. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, when you take mushrooms, uh, that you would smoke the bark of ayahuasca. How would you prepare the ayahuasca to smoke it? Oh, I would just shave the bark off and dry it in the sun, and then uh, grind it in some kind of a rough grinder and roll it into a bomb. That would be the thing to do. It's a very sweet, incense-tasting smoke. It's quite commercially viable. I mean, it's a pleasant thing to smoke. Master Alice's copy. Yeah. I was just going to ask, you're saying ayahuasca was the name Well, the word <laughs> ayahuasca is used to both refer to the plant of Master Alice's copy and to the prepared combinatory beverage with the Socotri viridis in it. Both are called ayahuasca, and you have to, by context, tell what is meant. Yeah. Last night you spoke of like uh, claims of consciousness, um, and I'm, in the, I'm uh, wondering what your uh, you consider indicators. I know you're not interested in, in talking about rules of living because you think other people they do that, and then like um, I don't know, it seems that you're, you're you think that is like spiritual materialism a lot. So I'm wondering what are your what do you consider indicators for of higher consciousness? 
Well, intellectual honesty is a good indicator of higher consciousness. Uh, unselfishness, diminishment of ego is, I guess, the thing. I mean, the people who are easy with what's going on. I like people who are easy to get along with. I'm easy to get along with. I'm not usually up for whatever's going on. I mean, if we want to go to bed at 9.30, that's fine. If we're going to dance till 4 a.m., I'm up. I'm up for it. I think uh, a, 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 an acceptance of flow and a sense of one's own place in things and ego Expression of ego is always an expression of an inappropriate valuation of the self. I mean, because you know, ultimately, you are not important. And if you act from that place, uh, I think you become much more palatable and attractive to other people. That doesn't mean that you're supposed to be hang dog and, and think of yourself as a nothing. It just means you need to have a perspective on, on how it all works. So, you know, an ability to get along with other people, to be gentle in most situations, and to pass in most situations is a sign of higher consciousness. And you should always be, you know, the welcome addition to any scene is the person of higher consciousness. The ideological grandstanding, dogmatism, domination, um, these are definitely signs of lower consciousness, even if they are in the service of some very high set of ideals. I mean, for instance, I've known uh, Tibetan lamas who, who you know, were absolute jerks, and yet they were clearly in the service of a very high philosophical position. But don't forget, it's entirely possible to know where it's at and not be there. You know? It's easy, in fact, to know where it's at. The trick is to be there. Well, where we're at is at the end of today's session. Thank you. of the Penois. Am I right? <coughs> so, apparently this morning the computer is up and running, at least so far. So I thought what I would do, this is the last session. It'll run until one. Remind me to take a break sometime roughly in the middle of it. And uh, th this is sort of on one level, why I do these things. As I said yesterday, um, much of what I say you could acquire in a library or by familiarizing yourself with the literature or the other personalities in the field. This part of the thing is to some degree more personal, more um, self-indulgent of me, I suppose. Uh, 
because this is the only original idea that I've ever come up with of any consequence or depth, I think. And my whole approach to the psychedelic experience is uh, as a fisherman for ideas. I mean, that's the metaphor I carry into the psychedelic state, that what we're doing is rowing out over dark water beyond the reef and letting the nets down and hoping for an idea. And hopefully it's not an idea so huge that it leaves the nets rent to shreds. And hopefully it's not so trivial that like minnows it just passes through. You want a medium-sized idea that you can take back to the community and that will be food in some sense. So. Uh, you know, in, in the grand style, I suppose, of all the people I dump on, the channelers, the gurus, and so forth and so on, I too am burdened with an irrational vision that is a revelation from the unconscious. Uh, I like to think that mine is more persuasive uh, because it's rooted in mathematics and it's rooted in the I Ching. So, um, I'll just talk about this for a while and then we'll lead into it and then I'll demonstrate the software and then we can either talk about it or if you find it uninteresting, we can um, get back to the surface and uh, square away your issues in some of these other areas. Uh, I have never, I regard myself, as I've said over and over in these lectures, as a fairly lumpen person rational, requiring drugs to access these dimensions, not lightly poised on the edge of the other. Um, nevertheless, coming out of the experiences that are described in true hallucinations, um, there were years, and in fact, to some degree it persists to this day, years of having a connection with a kind of organizing intelligence that seemed very different in its style of thinking from my own style of thinking. And the nature of the dialogue with this entity, it wasn't about world peace and loving one another or one woman, one child or any of these grandiose things that we've talked about here. It was more in the nature of a koan, like a problem that I was supposed to solve, that if I could solve, then there would somehow be great benefit for me intellectually behind this. And, but it was clearly something that I had originally encountered in the psychedelic state and that stuck with me. And, you know, if you want to understand how I got to that place, True Hallucinations tells that story to some degree. Um, <laughs> This dialogue with the mushroom mother took the form of a kind of very deep deconstruction of what the I Ching is about. Because apparently time is the key both to understanding the psychedelic experience and to understanding the mystery of our own life and existence, both generally and particularly. Time is the thing that we need to concentrate on and understand. And of course, if you look at the literature of human philosophy, you discover that the oldest book in the world is a book that is a study of time. The Book of Changes, the I Ching, uh, the distillation of pre-Joe philosophical ruminations that go back to the late Neolithic. Nobody knows how old. And now I'm going to talk about this in some detail. I assume most people in this room are, have some kind of familiarity with the I Ching, right? Am I right? So just briefly to review for those of you with, who lack the courage to admit ignorance. Uh, <laughs> I Ching 
is a system of Chinese divination that uses 64 uh, six-line structures called hexagrams. And these hexagrams are thought to be gestalt images of the way in which power is distributed within a given situation that the person inquiring of the oracle has defined ahead of time. And these 64 hexagrams, as they're called, define the complete set of possible structures given the rules that you have six levels and broken and unbroken lines. Then there are 64 variants on that set of constraints. And these are called uh, hexagrams. Uh, we all know this, am I right? Yes, okay. The hexagrams occur in a traditional order that is called the King Wen sequence. And King Wen is a quasi-legendary person, pre-Han dynasty, uh, a, a, a political figure who in the upheavals in ancient Neolithic China was imprisoned. And during his imprisonment, uh, he supposedly elaborated these 64 hexagrams in this traditional sequence. Whether he was a real person, we'll probably never know. What the mushroom voice concentrated on was a very specific and intellectually defined question at first, at first. And the question was this, is the King Wen sequence a sequence? In other words, is it simply a jumble, a jumbled arrangement of hexagrams that has become traditional over thousands of years? Or is it a true sequence, meaning can it be generated by rules? And if so, what are those rules? Well, if you had known me over a lifetime, you would know that this is not my style of thinking. I mean, I failed Algebra 2 after the stabbing, I transferred out. So, um, mathematics, that's a joke, folks. After, uh, after, uh, after quadratic equations, I bailed. So, close thinking is not my forte. So here was this question, you know, is the King Wen sequence a sequence or is it a chaotic jumble? What are the rules which generate it? So I sat down with my I Ching and flipped it open. She like it much better. Oh wow, what am I doing? Okay. Okay, that's like frontal face shot. So I'm trying to be in the center of a lot of opinions that float around. As like you know, I like to keep moving because if I stand still, right, I have injured my ankle and I'm still in the build up phase. Um, and so I rather keep moving. I'm in the delicate position of being in a shared living situation. I mean, different apartments, different nationalities around me um, just things I have to get used to 
so not getting used to this relying on other people for my income just by continuing to do what I'm doing and then just showing a little what I've learned and I have to be open uh, also about that one I smoked I have mint tea <laughs> just like leafy mint tea it's like dry not like tea bags more like what you would get from a tea shop and then in tea bags but yeah I mean you could just buy this like mint hack in tea shops and if you still like tobacco but what I've realized is that smoking tobacco is over longer periods of time feeding too much into your shadow qualities <laughs> you know i never expect to talk about the things that i talk about until i'm suddenly talking about them and then i realize you know why i'm always holding on you know how long did it take me now to open up into realizing or think uh, into realizing that i and i actually think <laughs> that the person who's living underneath me is not at home. But I'm not quite sure, right? Because you don't always see her car when she's there because she may park somewhere else. And that means how am I to know if I'm allowed to speak? How loud can I speak? So that people won't hear me. Um, but I think if you just, I mean, if I would be listening to an audiobook right now, and that's, I think, what I did in this session, I was testing um, the environment. How loud is it still okay to listen to something? And then if somebody's talking in a baritone voice, this may actually get you to sleep. I'm just thinking of a Disney movie. I think it's... Uh, you know, sometimes I have these images in my head. Just if I let my mind wander, and it's so hard to describe, but when I'm in a room with people, you know, I'm like a bit like Johnny Depp in as the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. I mean, he's just standing there and he's looking at all of these people and some wear like fake noses and some wear like fake smiles and some have like fake breasts. And then, you know, we all have these gimmicks that we put onto ourselves to hide who we really are. But what I started to realize and now comes the the fist, yeah, the fist, the fist, the fist, yeah. I should probably do it like this now. It's like the masculine fist, okay? I can be all wobbly and all nice. And I can be super gentle with you, right? Or I can have a bit of spike, like a bit of a spike, you know? And then it's hard. I have trouble to maintain this. Right, right, you know what I mean? You know, I'm supposed to be a man, and I think I am, but then there's this little child inside of me, and I always want to play, and it's so nice to play, but you know, I can't be that all the time. You know, I cannot just all the time watch TV to keep myself happy and play video games, you know, to distract myself from the reality that, you know, there are things I could, should probably deal with, right? It's like, and because it's all too much and I don't know where to start, you know, I just, you know, look the other way. It's like, uh, you, you know, it's like you walk through the streets and then there's a junkie, you know, dying in a puddle of his own blood you know just like be radical sometimes because this shit is happening to people i mean 
I see people who die in their own homes because they don't know how to free themselves of basically their own situation. I mean, they're sitting around waiting for somebody to help them. And it's like, oh, I'm injured. Yes, so what, man? Nobody built me up. I went hiking. I went hiking to be strong. And now the question is, can I maintain this, you know, everyone I see, you know, and I go to you and say, oh, let me help you. You know, and I go there and I help you and then I've helped you and then oh, I was like, oh, and then I think, you know, now you sit around waiting for me and you just do nothing. And when I see you next time, you know, you just, oh, now I see you know, how weird people are. You know, they realize if I injure myself, you know, that's just, I just had an insight because something is happening to me in my own life. And now I'm focused on solving this because I'm not sure as to how to react in certain situations because I'm always overcomplicating everything because I think too much and I can never really relax. You know, it's like... I'm trying to explain to people that this thing is always running and the only way I can distract myself from just hacking everything to bits with my mind to find like, ah, I'm looking for something. And what I'm really looking for is probably, you know, I don't know what I have to do to free myself of my current situation because you know I really want to be successful with what I'm doing and I'm improving you know at a great speed and it's like you know I don't want to be super over excited about it because that's the kind of mentality I hate that because it's hard to you know you can never maintain that you know I think the best way to deal with doing what you love is to just hate it a little because if it's too easy i don't know i think it would get boring after a while so i like to make things harder because sometimes it seems it's too easy and i had too much of the comforts but you know it was like people were trying to get me to do their chores you know it's like i don't know mothers that use their sons to get away from their fathers or fathers that use their daughters to get away from their wives it's like um it's like why do fathers have to flirt with you know, like the sister-in-law. I mean, they should know how to invest themselves into growing things and not meddle with existing relationships because they can't get it together with their wife or cannot have a new partner, right? It's like, Everybody's using others, you know, it's like a child should be protected from hungry wolves. And the way we deal with children is, you know, as soon as a child comes, you know, I'm just going to name them out, all the leeches who rely on others for their love, who basically, I don't know, or they're just selfish with, with what they have. And they just all keep it to themselves, like, yeah. My precious. You know, you can also be like this sometimes. Yeah. Because, I mean, what's ugly? I'm not sure. You know, sometimes I think I'm handsome. And then I think I'm fucking ugly. I mean, I don't brush my teeth. You know, I'm a bit dirty. You know, my hands are, I don't know, I feel a bit filthy. And I'm not sure if I should even 
um, spend time with women anymore because I'm afraid that they would just be, you know, I'm not sure if they should be disgusted of me. You know, I'm really open about this. I mean, oh, wow, what's this? Oh, wow, <laughs> yeah. And then the question is, how much does my outfit actually create or impact the way I behave in front of others. So if I'm dressing myself in a way that is like super attractive, right? He's like this, here's like, oh, mm, oh, he's, look how sexy it is, you know, oh, mm, he's got tattoos. Like, it's like really weird when you're honest about it. And then of course we have to talk about diet. Um, I was actually looking for a new way of engaging with these recordings. And the weird thing is that the best time for me is night. And I've been placed in an apartment where the person living under me is almost never there. And I don't know, the bedroom of this person is like really far away. So it's unlikely that anyone can hear me. But I still manage to create an atmosphere that is like really enjoyable because I'm not too loud, but I, you know, I, I do move around. I'm actually picking up vibes from my controller. And that's actually an interesting idea to film myself with the camera. And, you know, the problem is that I never want to do things just right away. You know, that's like the strange thing. I first want to have one experience like this. And then I could, for example, say, okay, the next day I'm going to film myself while I'm playing Crash Bandicoot. I think that's really nice. You know, or I'm just going to set up this camera um, and just film myself the way you usually film myself. But I think it would actually be really nice to film myself playing Crash Bandicoot while filming playing Crash Bandicoot and then cutting them together. I mean, that's even a better idea. I mean, now you understand, I need to motivate myself again to do content in different kinds of ways. So to basically have a reason to learn, to move forward and to engage with the content that I'm actually trying to create. Because if I'm running out of ideas, because I'm just rushing to everyone to help them, you know, they cannot, you know, I can't help it, man. People pay my apartment and I have to be open about this because I have helped them in some way or other and they were looking for ways to repay me. Because if they, they would have felt threatened by me and what I have done, because I help in a very weird way, right? You know, I probably don't tell you what to do. You know, I tell you how to do it. But there's a hidden message. It's like weird. I don't know, I don't really know how I'm doing this because sometimes I say things on the surface. <laughs> it's really weird. I say things on the surface just to make conversation. But I'm saying something completely different. And I'm kind of threatening to people. And that's also, you know, I'm not sure if that's the tobacco and the diet and the sugar and the coffee, because that's the shadow. And sometimes I feel like maybe I should try to be a bit more light again, because I was like really going shadow, boom. And that sounds so stupid. I mean, who can take saying things like this serious 
And that's what I have, you know, when I, I don't know. I mean, I have times where I say things and they make sense at the time that I'm, I'm saying them. But then I can basically turn around and completely forget what we just talked about. And then when I later create content, suddenly it would come back. It's like I'm having conversations with people and, you know, something really is happening. I mean, I've spent time with someone in a park and she was like super stuck somewhere. You know, what I'm trying to tell people is, and that's actually what I've tried to communicate to everyone, but just took me a really long time to understand how to explain to people how I see the world and life. Wow, you know, I think I'm finally starting to realize you know, there are certain things, you know, I cannot just tell you that. Do you get it? If I would just say that's how it is, then you would not know how it is because you have no experience. So I have to take what I know and stretch it out just to make sure to give you the whole vision the image of what I'm now trying to tell you, okay? Because everything that I've just said somehow comes together into this one thing that I'm now going to point out to you, okay? So I have no idea what I just said. But if you would take this point as the, you know, every time you get here, you can see <laughs> if there's something new you've to... no seriously this sounds really stupid it sounds really stupid because why would i want people to listen to me i record this because i want to share what i find in a way that is understandable because maybe this is also when I have to quote people like Rondas where he says, you know, I never give, you, sometimes I give exact quotes, but you know, I don't want to be too stuck on this. You know, I know quite, you know, what he said, but I don't have to write it down all the time. But he said something like, you know, I just have so many words, basically, you know. I have so many words, you know. They're just there. I mean, when I'm with people, I'm just going to talk you through the experience. Because what I've learned is, you know, I don't know. People, sometimes, I don't know. I just feel like if I stop talking, people always get so nervous. Or maybe I'm just trying to shut, you know, I'm not quite sure how I am to people, to be honest. You see, and that's also the problem that I have sometimes. You know, if I would be alone now, like I would know there would be nobody living there. I would just go and take a shower. And the question is, just because you, if you get weird remarks from people about how their previous uh, neighbor, I mean, the previous guy who lived here, you know, And that, you know, it's hard to pay attention also when you're alone. I mean, I think it's hard to pay attention in a conversation. And what's even harder is how people always expect me 
to pay attention to everything they're saying. And then they kind of wait for you to not listen anymore. And when they catch you, that you shut off, you know, they kind of get pissed at you. You know, do you understand what it means to me? I'm just trying to explain this to you. I mean, first of all, nobody, right, is forcing you to listen to me. I understand that it is really weird, like really weird. It's really, really weird. I mean, I feel weird showing you basically my private life. I mean, I'm literally, I mean, how much more? private can you get right I mean you understand what I'm trying to say so the question is how am I to see myself can I have relationships to women well I feel like I cannot make content when there's women around, can I? Or I mean, I actually can, but should I? You know, am I willing to expose women or anyone, but women in particular, because the only people that would spend a lot of time with me would be women? So the question is, you see, I have become a public figure, right? And I stand for something. And because I stand for something, I also have a responsibility to really be what I represent. And I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. I mean, I'm not sure where I'm going to get. And whether or not I can actually choose. I mean, you could say that, you know, if you're doing a good job, would you you know if the people would come and say, Can you do this for us? Would you refuse them? Right? But let's say I know a lot about psychedelics, but some of these things are illegal in the country that, you know, he or she is living in. So if somebody would come now and ask you, can you do this? This is black tea with cumin, anise, and something else seeds. So, you see, how much of my life could I expose here, you know, because, I mean, I have been with people and we have held ayahuasca ceremonies together in areas where you know, people say <laughs> you cannot do this. I mean, that it's illegal still now, right? If the picture of the world that we are being shown is actually real, you know, I'm starting to doubt this because I'm starting to pick up like vibes 
because I spend time with different cultures and I'm starting to see through the bubble of each of these cultures. So I kind of, I stand on my own. Also with my beliefs, I have no church that I follow. The only thing I follow is what makes sense to me specifically. And I spend hours taking the time to figure out whether or not I like something. So if there's a woman that would like me, for instance, and she would, you know, I'm just trying to tell you how complicated things are for me. You know, I know that, you know, if there would be a woman, you know, I don't know it actually. And that's, you know, every time I think I know it, I, I don't know it. You know, if a woman would come now and like be really like, oh, I love you, take me, you know, it's like super nice and sex and would I want this? I mean, when I think about it, it's like super nice. And then I'm asking myself, but do I have to be now married to the last woman I slept with? And can I actually have sex with other women? Am I going to fall into hell if I touch another woman? Because I actually do believe that witchcraft exists. So if you smoke tobacco or you spend a lot of time with people that smoke tobacco, what you can certainly know is that you are going to attract dark spirits into your life. So if you want to, you know, the best friends to have are probably people that maybe like to smoke a cigarette once in a while or like to really enjoy smoking a cigarette or a cigar sometimes. You know, you can enjoy doing chape, but that's like, you know, I also like cigarillos occasionally. And smoking joints, yeah, okay. And then you can pure and you can also use, you know, now I use mint, you can use sage, mint, yeah, also, you know, you can use tobacco. But it just makes you like really like, ah. tobacco, right? It's like, ah. And you're completely mad and wasted and then sugar. I mean, it's really weird, but now I start to know, you know, I'm very fine tuned. So I just stopped eating sugar for just a bit now, but it already feels like I already let go of how I felt with, with the sugar. You know, I don't have hangovers anymore. I mean, I can drink five, six beer and then I just focus on getting through it. You know, I don't like <laughs> do like this and then I crash. That's how some people do it. That's how most people that I see celebrate ayahuasca. They just go there. They drink this, like to basically just get hammered. And then they like, oh, la, la, la. you know, they just dance around. And then everybody hugs each other. You like get completely wasted and then you just merge into each other. It's like, bleh, it's like, that's what you hear of MDMA parties, right? These things just become orgies after a while. And I'm not sure how aware people are. And I'm actually starting to think that some of the people you think you know actually use drugs to have sex with other men. And I'm not sure who. I'm not sure actually who. You know, sometimes, you know, you know what I mean? I don't know who you are because I don't see you all the time. So if there's a woman that wants to be with me, I'd probably have to see her all the time. You know, we would probably always have to be in the same room because 
every time there starts to be a distance, people just freak out completely. And I really think there are some women that need this. And I would certainly need it because I was always there for people. But when it came to it, nobody was really there for me. And then the question is, do I have to be there for people always? I mean, I'm just being shipped off to an apartment, which is really nice, you know, really grateful. But I was still kind of discarded. And so I think people just have to feel the gravity of the consequences of everyone's actions. And sometimes you just have to be the spokesperson for your own revolution, if you want to call it that. Where you say, I revolute, I revolutionize, I revolutionize the way people engage with each other by making sure that they learn how to respect other people just by teaching other people nature's way, by engaging with them in a way that shows how much going into nature and also working with psychedelics to heal yourself and being in bare feet, you know, reducing sugar, reducing caffeine. You know, I usually, even if I feel like drinking more, I drink one espresso. You know, I, actually it's an Americano, so I make an espresso kind of a shot. And then I pour hot water on top, that's an Americano. But I make it Italian style because I have this Bialetti can, which I have shown several times. So and what I was doing until now was basically, I was just showing you how I live and then just dumping all this knowledge onto you at the same time to show you how far you can go. And that is basically, you know, I'm completely out of control, if you know what I mean. I mean, I don't even remember that I started standing on one leg. I mean, I realized I was moving, but actually I was standing here before. But actually, I don't know, I started to feel kind of uneasy. So I just let myself, you know, wander a little. And because I have trained standing on one leg with the slack line, I have walked barefoot for years. I have done balancing exercises, you know, I can make this look really easy. But there are also um, hindrances, such as sitting a lot. So I was actually looking for the strength to get to be like this. And the thing is, if I don't take the time to experiment with these positions and with my own abilities, I actually don't know. You know I cannot progress if I never do anything different. So you have to make new experiences and because this is my body and I want to have the best experience there is also sexually. And I'm not sure if I have to have a woman that's as tough as me or if I, you know, do I have to focus now on one woman or can I just have sex with anyone? You know, that's what I mean. I mean, do I have to be married? You know, is all hell gonna break loose if I sleep with another woman now? You know, am I going to ruin the love of the last woman I slept with because I sleep with other women? Or is it maybe even my job as someone who has kind of transformed himself into something else to give this energy to women freely if they want it? You know, it's like, I mean, if that isn't heaven, I mean, if one woman isn't enough, then I 
assume five are. <laughs> I mean, do you get what I mean? I mean, there are people like this. So how greedy am I allowed to be? Because I actually don't want to be the husband to one woman. And I actually went to great length to keep such a woman away from me. Because I do need a lot of space to myself. I mean, I tried woman and child. It was, it was driving me insane. I mean, don't get me wrong. But I have heard stories from people. I mean, I'm just talking. This is honest now. I have spent some time watching stuff about indigenous people and also Terence McKenna talks about these things um, it's better to quote him on this because he's already dead I mean not to me I mean he kind of lives on through his I would call it art you see I've learned so much from other people how could I stand here and think that I'm the only one but sometimes I'm just not sure what the teaching is. I'm not sure if the teaching is, you know, you know, marriage sucks. I'm not sure because I feel like I like how I look, you know. Maybe I'm trying to be super sexy, right? You know, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to be now. Is this a good representation of what I'm trying, you know, I feel comfortable like this. Am I too old to look like that? I feel really young. I feel really young. I don't know what 34 is supposed to be like. Because the more experiences I make, the better I'm feeling. But I make experiences in a way that allow me to heal and to get stronger. So if I'm afraid, then I have to know that I can, I don't know, be tough. Which is why this is an outfit, what you could say, like, it's kind of like tough. It's tough to pull it off. If you go like this into the city, it's tough to pull it off. I, I feel like a pimp. I feel like a pimp. Actually, or maybe this is really nice. It's like, hey, yo, dope. You know, maybe this is really nice. But I do feel like, I don't know, when I see myself from the top, it's like, it's like hanging, right? You see, I'm really insecure. Which is why I sometimes spend a lot of time picking the outfit that I'm going to wear. <sighs> wow. You know, and this, I don't know if people are freaked out. Because sometimes I sit with them and then just stuff happens. You know, like, yeah. something, sh you know, it's like shaking through me. And sometimes I have the feeling people think, you know, I have the feeling they all think I'm enlightened because I think I'm enlightened. I mean, I enlighten people. Or maybe I don't, you know, I'm not quite sure because maybe people enlighten me. And I hate to think like this. You know, I just want to be the smartest guy around. You know, I don't want to learn from others. <laughs> and others don't really want to learn from me, right? It's like... We just try to teach each other. You know, we all want to be the teacher. But I think maybe it's better if we just accept that life is the teacher and we participate in it, you know? So that's the game about living, right? That's the game about living. And also, if I walk around in the streets, do I have to take my hands out of my pockets? You know, is this like, why do people always say I have to? Because I'm queen, you know what I mean? I don't have to 
Right? I mean, <laughs> call it Billy the Kid or something. And I've got wit, right? So is this, is this okay? You know, could I walk around like this? I'm not sure. I just, whatever I wear just changes the perception of, you know, how I feel so much. forget it I think I've said enough you can wear different outfits you know your diet impacts everything race like I think it's time to let this uh...